Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the top tier brewing stand. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. Time for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think, Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. <laughs> uh, uh, greetings, greetings. Uh, joking here. Uh, uh. <sighs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you'll notice, Scott, uh, once we're like, you know, on the third hour of drinking and talking. It, it just becomes much. an hour of throat clearing, basically. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it becomes a, a drooling mess. So, uh, look what you signed up to do. Yeah. All right. Well, it's entertaining listening to you guys clear your throats. I have to admit, <laughs> it's a lot more entertaining when I do it. See, watch. <clears throat> See, yeah, that was, was that was right. Yeah. That was nothing. Well, that's that was what I was nothing. saying. <clears throat> yeah, we're uh, we're professionals. I, I hope you know that. Well, I'm learning. We get we get you know we get compensated for this. Have you noticed how furiously I've been scribbling notes on my notepad? No. No. I thought you were just playing with yourself, but yeah, that's all right. If that's what you call taking notes on your notepad, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Kind of a small pen. <laughs> there you. <laughs> Move on, please. <laughs> Speaking of moving said. on, yeah. <laughs> open our great friend uh, John Blickman. Hey, yes. He knows how to move on <laughs> like the best of them. That's right. I don't know what that means. And but, innovate at the same time. And, and while he's innovating, he's moving on and innovating at the same time. And if you want to move on in your brewing equipment, if you want to Take move to level. move to the next level, yeah, step it up. Really become, uh, you know, uh, serious about your brewing brewing habit. Well, then and, your brewing addiction, mm-hmm. whatever it might be, then I suggest going to BlickmanEngineering dot com. Blickman with two ends and a C H and. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, it, yeah. It, the, the equipment John makes is all designed to, uh, you know, make your brewing more consistent, make it uh, easier to manage, mm-hmm. and uh, really does, you know, good equipment really does improve your ability as a brewer to brew more consistent beer. Uh, for me, honestly, it, it makes it more fun. I actually kind of geek out about it, and, That's and uh, I find it more entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> when there's lots of shiny stainless and valves and bells and whistles. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in fact, I mean, to, to, I was just thinking the other, um, just yesterday, I was describing brewing on a top tier system to a brewer at the uh, Hop Growers Convention. And, uh, you know, telling with the, with the Tower of Power, being able to do multi rest mashes is very easy. It's, you simply, mm-hmm. you know, type in the next temperature you want to go to and it does it i mean just yeah. kind of put the new temperature and stand back and watch it happen it's that's pretty amazing really well i i think um you know there's something to be said for single infusion but yeah. a lot of times you know i think i i look at single infusion because well it's just easier than multi-step yeah. um but, you know i think proper multi-step it, uh, you know there's there's value there there's uh there can be uh, you know, uh, value there depending on you know what yeah. malts you're using, things like that. So, yeah, if you uh, just want to geek out on your brewing because you know yeah, it's fun, because you can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm with you on that. I think that's a, a great way to go. Well, what we're doing is uh, live Q and A. If you've been sticking with us, uh, there's there's people in the chat. You can go to the brewingnetwork.com. You can listen live. You can participate in the uh, in the chat room and ask questions right. of. Uh, the show you don't need a password or login just and type in a name and type in a click. name make something up like a spider wrangler or grod mm-hmm. and uh there you go and you're you're off and running speaking of off and running how about uh 
start us off with a uh, question, question for the okay, Q&A. You that. can you can also email your questions in uh, mm. Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com. If you want it, you want it answered in one of these Q&A shows, put Q&A in the put title. Put Q&A in the title. That's a, a much quicker way to get an answer. Uh, if you're looking at a, a whole show topic, put like a show topic in the title and, yeah. uh, and we'll we consider it for well an entire to, show. You know, big flags like that. Yes, and all the, you know, grow your penis type of things. Well, mm-hmm. we, we respond to those immediately, but, uh, right, right. yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. And if you want to give us money. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, if you've got it. money in Nigeria. <laughs> That's right. Go yeah, ahead. We're, we're your man. Okay. Hey, Bruce Strong Q&A. This is from Brett uh, Shigoge. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Okay, I'll move closer. Uh, this is from Brett, and it says, How long can uncanned starter wort be kept in the fridge before botulism occurs? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm not a pathologist, although I played with one in college. But <laughs> the backstory is, I saw an article on a blog stating the beer brewer used the microwave to quickly make starter wort with mm-hmm. DME. The hot starter wort was then covered and left in the fridge. The next day, it was taken out of the fridge and the yeast was pitched. Hmm. Is this an effective method of cutting down the time to make the starter wort? Uh, Princes don't have to boil and chill well, in the sink, or is this dangerous? Thanks, Brett. So here's the thing. <clears throat> you know, botulism doesn't occur spontaneously. Right. It's like bacteria doesn't occur. You know, back in the medieval times, they'd be like, oh, you know, people just got sick by magic. Um, uh, but you know, botulism doesn't occur spontaneously from within something. If the spores aren't there, then there's no risk of botulism. Right. However, um, you know, it, it, to be on the safe side with foods that are not, you know, acidic enough, you have to sterilize them, pressure, right. temperature, time, and, you know, enough to destroy spores. Right. And then there's no risk of botulism. Normal boiling won't destroy spores. Right. So, but the fact that you keep it in the refrigerator, just like regular food. So you've got, yeah. you know, you've made soup. Yep. And the soup is just as likely to have botulism spores in it as you've got your... Starter malt works. extract, you've made a starter in a pot on the stove, your botulism danger levels are probably about the same. Right. As, you know, done in your kitchen, on the stove, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. You put that soup in the refrigerator, you know, how many weeks would you eat that soup? So essentially, <laughs> essentially, you know, it's it's, it's about the, the, the same type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, botulism. You know, I think the, the, the risk risk is there. The colder it is, right. the, the less growth you're going to get. You're not going to get the spores. Botulism. I think uh, the spores erupt and grow into all this terrible stuff uh, at you know higher temperatures than refrigeration. That's why refrigeration temperatures are below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. And because it suppresses <clears throat> the spores and things like that, and right. so you don't run the risk of botulism. <laughs> Botulism is like in canned goods that are stored on shelves and things like right. that. Uh, that's that's really where when you're storing room temperature that you so you you get a much longer period of time right. if it's refrigerated the entire time. Right. It's yeah. Botulism still has to grow, and the reason it grows is, and the reason people fear it is because you've supposedly canned, you've boiled, you've canned the good, and then it sits on the shelf for weeks or months. And during that time, if there's boxes or years. There, yeah, it can grow to lethal mm-hmm. levels. But um, certainly boiling in the microwave and putting it in the refrigerator for a short period of time. Well, boiling you know, on the stove, boiling in the microwave, it's the same kind of boiling. It, it just, as long as it's right. boiling, yeah. uh, you know, it's boiling. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's temperature, time, and boiling is not, does not actually, you know, have any effect other than you've reached 212 degrees or whatever depending on the, right. you know what altitude you're at kill active bacteria but yeah, no active it's just no spores a certain it's an indicator of a certain level of heat mm-hmm. and then uh you know you've got it at that heat uh you've 
killed, whatever, but you're still not killing the spores. Right. So the answer to the question is, is this an, is this an effective method of cutting down the time to make a starter wort? Sure. Yeah, sure. There you go. Here's your answer. Right. Done. Done. All right, here's one from Casey about uh, forced carving. Hey, guys, when forced carving a beer in a corny keg, should I hook up my CO2 line to the in or the out? Follow-up, what PSI and how long do I leave it? Uh, there's charts for that in books called How to Brew and uh, Bring Classic Styles. Indeed. Uh, I know it sounds like a dumb question, but I've just started kegging, and both times I've done it. It turned out fine with the CO2 on the in line set for 30 PSI for three days and then dropped to 10 PSI for serving. It is brewing with a friend. He told me that I should be carving through the outline because the dip tube goes all the way to the bottom and will carve the beer faster <laughs> since it's submerged and will bowl up the CO2 from the bottom. Does it matter? Casey, it does not really matter. The size of the bubbles from the bottom and the, the, the difference in carbonation time is minimal. Yeah. I mean, if you do a really fine bubble through oh, a really small so. stone a uh, centered stone then maybe you're 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 gaining something but uh through the dip tube no no don't even bother just uh yeah. do what you're doing that's what i always do i can't imagine you save even five minutes going to the out um and then you have to mess around with you know because the in and out connections are not the same you gotta have an out connection, and then you gotta have an in connection for the serving. You gotta swap those things around. You probably lose more time dicking around with it than you do just doing what you're doing. There you go. What's your next one, there, uh, Palmer? Well, it's a it's a long one. It's from uh, Robert. He's Blatt. got a long one. Palmer's got a long one. <laughs> uh, but it's a bottle conditioning question, and he has. Well, he, let me let me go into all the accolades he heaps on you. Okay, I'm an there you go. That's, to the that's what I wanted you to read. Yeah, that's why I printed that one out. Jay Z, I am a huge fan of your throat clearing. <coughs> <laughs> all right, there you go. I'm a fan of your huge throat. <laughs> I discovered you guys about a month ago, and have been slowly making my way through the old shows starting in 2005. I recently started listening to Bruce Strong as well. I followed Jamil's advice about sanitation and using a big yeast starter in my last batch, two liters in a five gallon batch. I started with the 1050 All Grain Pale Ale. It started fermenting within three hours and seemed to complete after about four days. I bottled in another batch over the weekend and planned on checking the gravity of the pale ale and bottling if possible. Unfortunately, I dropped my hydrometer and broke it. I tasted the beer and it was not sweet. I bottled the batch after seven days. I am bottle conditioning with about one cup of DME. I paid careful attention to the cleanliness of the bottles and soaked them in iota for before bottling. I'm not overly concerned about infection. My question is, what is the danger oh, of exploding bottles? What is the probability <laughs> that the beer completed the fermentation in seven days? Is there anything I can do to mitigate the risk? They are stored at 68 degrees and it's very constant. Any advice you could give would be appreciated. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, Brew Tattoo will have read the question and we'll have an answer for you. Back after this. When you hear Blickman Engineering, think innovation, passion, quality, and customer service. Blickman Gear is designed by brewers to give you a sense of pride in your equipment. At Blickman, they know what makes brewing a pain and build gear that makes it fun. Like the intuitive beer gun, a completely different approach to filling bottles. The Therminator Wart Chiller, a new take on a plate chiller that's sized for flow, performance, and the high groundwater temps home brewers face every day. The Brewmometer, a brilliant well thermometer design with brewing parameters right on the dial. The auto sparge, ultimate simplicity for preventing an overflow or running your mash tun dry. And much more, like the modular top tier brewing stand, conical fermenters, and their boiler maker brew pots. With more cutting edge equipment coming soon, keep up with the latest from Blickman at BlickmanEngineering.com and stay on the cutting edge. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters, this is Jamel Zanisha, and I love a bold, hoppy beer, one that spits resin in your face and makes you cry, Uncle. There are a lot of great hoppy beers out there, but at Heretic, we want to make something as bold, dank, and resiny as possible. We use hops at every chance we get, including multiple dry hop additions. The result is Heretic Evil Cousin. This light golden, 
8% Imperial IPA has an easy malt character that helps take the edge off the massive bittering, but it takes a back seat to the in-your-face hop character. We make sure this beer finishes dry so the hops can jump out and slam me in the taste buds. If you can't get enough hoppy goodness, Evil Cousin is your cup of tea. Cheers. Williams Brewing is your online resource for prompt delivery of quality home brewing supplies. Since 1979, Williams Brewing has offered the finest equipment and freshest ingredients and the best customer service in the business. Cut hours off your brewing sessions by using one of our 11 varieties of famous Williams malt extract. Our Williams Belgian Pale Extract is mashed with pure Belgian two-row malt and a small percentage of Belgian wheat malt for an authentic Belgian character you just can't get from other extracts. Or check out our unique fermenters, two-and-a-half-gallon kegs, paintball tank-based draft beer equipment, bottling aids, and much more. We even have our own line of precision hydrometers. Go to williamsbrewing.com to browse our vast selection. That's williamsbrewing.com. Orders placed by 3.30 p.m. Pacific time ship the same day. Brewing is easy. The Williams way. Ten, huh? Getting tired of that same old handcrafted beverages day after day? Are you looking for something with more diversity than your normal beer? Fellow BN Army member Michael Fairbrother, owner of Moonlight Meadery, is reviving an entire beverage category. Mead! The meads at Moonlight Meadery are all handcrafted from the finest honey on the market and are perfect for any occasion, like weddings, baby showers, or... Excuse me? Mead is not your average girly drink, mister. And Moonlight Meads can be enjoyed anytime, anywhere. Football games with the guys. Yeah. Barbecues with the guys. Yeah. Operating power tools with the guys. Yeah. Um, actually, sir, that's really dangerous. Good point, son. Next time you have something to celebrate or are just looking for a new tasting experience, pick up a bottle of mead from Moonlight Meadery. Now in 21 states, making over 60 varieties of mead from dry, semi-sweet to sweet. Break out of that craft beer low. Grab a bottle of Moonlight Mead. Can't find some? Then ask. No, make that demand some. Yeah! Yeah! What'd you get? More brewing ingredients? Yep. You know what I love about Brewmaster's Warehouse? The $6.99 shipping. Well, yeah, but... Oh, the in-store classes for beginning brewers. Yeah, that's cool, but... Oh, oh, the brew builder. Creating and saving your recipes online is awesome. No, I'm... Yes, but the cheese-making supplies. No. Oh, the wine-making supplies. (sighs) Oh, the distilling equipment and liquor flavorings. All that stuff is awesome, yes, but what I really love is that the guy who runs it is totally hot. And, and that brew builder software is awesome. Oh, yeah. Brewmaster's Warehouse brings you flat rate shipping on great equipment and ingredients to make beer, wine, cheese, and spirits at brewmasterswarehouse.com. And if you're in Georgia, stop by Brewmaster's Warehouse Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6. Visit brewmasterswarehouse.com today because it's totally hot. Oh, yeah. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. We're doing a live Q&A uh, here, me and uh, Palmer and Scott, and our good friend, uh, Brew Tattoo, who has an answer to... Uh, our bottle conditioning question. Ro- Robert? Or- Robert Blood says... Robert, Robert's uh, question on bottle conditioning. <clears throat> what, what, do you, what do you say in this case? I say to Robert that he has got no problem whatsoever. I think he's okay. You know, all the conditions that he spelled out in his email, he's he's got no problem. He's yeah. good. Should he's be good. should be fine. I mean, the only thing I can say was, you know, it's not going to hurt anything if you give it a little bit more fermentation time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, another week, and you're fine. All right. Well, it depends on the yeast too. I mean, something like a an English ale yeast that tends to you know, be done in three or four days. Uh, you know, seven's seven's good. If it's uh, uh, you know a Belgian yeast or a saison yeast, it tends to take a little bit longer. Then you know maybe that could be an issue. He doesn't mention what kind of yeast he's he's right. using there. He Over says it's beer. like a pale ale or something like that. Oh, yeah. So okay. so maybe it was a cal ale, and then you're kind of in the middle there. Uh, so th- that would be fine. But again, you know, I, I agree. In, in in general, I think I think you're right that there's probably nothing to worry about there. One way to find out if 
uh, there was an issue is if he did a forced ferment test at the beginning, right. then uh, that would tell you how much it's supposed to attenuate to. Of course, uh, he busted his hydrometer, so, so no way to measure it. Yeah. No way to measure it. But but I mean, he could have tasted the side by side or something. I don't know. I, I, I think you know the essential question is what's the probability that the beer completed the fermentation in seven days? Pretty 90, high. 90, 90 plus percent. Yeah, and he t- he said I tasted tasted the beer and it was not sweet. Yeah, so he's he's good. There's probably nothing. Yeah, and especially non when it when it's not carbonated, you taste it and it doesn't taste sweet. That means it's pretty dry <laughs> once you yeah. carbonate it. Uh, so yeah, I, I think. Uh, but yeah, yeah. There's there's no need to rush this though. I mean, bottle the batch after seven days. I mean, yeah. you know, let it go two weeks. Or if three if weeks. your yeast that you started with is fresh and healthy. Uh, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna die and barf up, and you don't have to hurry. Yeah. Uh, when I first started homebrewing, they're like, "Okay, on day seven, you do this." Yeah. Had no input onto what it looked like, what you were doing, what yeast strain, what the gravity was. You just always day seven, you do this. Day fourteen, you do this, and it was just like a fixed thing, which which made no sense to me. I would say that. Uh, sorry. Okay. I would say that. He has said that he has tasted it. Uh huh. And that is key, right there. Yeah. He's tasted yeah. it. Yeah, he's, he's got some measurement at least, yeah. some sensory evaluation. I'm a, I'm a big believer in tasting your beer at every stage. Mm-hmm. You know, you, your runoff, you can taste it when it's done. Mm-hmm. Yep. Your wort, you can taste it, and you know what it you know you know what it tastes like. And you stick your finger your, your finger in your belly button, you taste it. Oh yeah, well that's nice. And you know. But and then you, you taste your finished beer, mm-hmm. you know, in the fermenter, mm-hmm. and you get an idea for what that tastes like compared right. to as fermented or as carbonated. Mm-hmm. It's got a different flavor every step of the way, and and your ingredients too. Taste your ingredients at every right. step of the way. You know, your your raw malt and everything else. Mm-hmm. You get a good feel for it, and you know when it's done. Without if you break your hydrometer, right, and you taste your beer, and it's like, hey, that's done. You're good. Right, yeah. I agree with you 100. percent If you've been doing that, if you've been tasting everything mm-hmm. uh, as you brew every every time you brew, you should be tasting everything. Like like uh, Brutetti is saying, um, when you run into a problem where you don't have equipment, you, know, you broke your hydrometer, you can taste it and go, "Oh no, that tastes done." Yeah, that's 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 right, and uh, you, you know. So you know, experience is is a good guide, and uh, tasting is as well. All right. Uh, I know we got some people in the chat that are anxious to ask some questions. Why don't we snap one of those off, Scott? All righty. This one's from the Matt Smith. He said, "I ferment with a temperature control in a dedicated fridge with a therm wrap. I usually only have one carboy at a time, but is it safe to assume that if I have two carboys in the fridge and only one being controlled, will the ferment condition uh, be identical to the other carboy? In other words, no." Unless the fermentation conditions are identical, no. Uh, same yeast, same pitch rate, same gravity, same sugar um, makeup, same oxygen levels, same nutrient levels. Uh, there's no guarantee that it'll be the same. It should, it might be close if you start them both at the same time. Like, like, let's say you um, you're making ten gallons of beer and uh, you split your your wort into two carboys and you do your best to pitch equal amounts of the same starter and oxygenate them the same and then put them in the same fridge and like that, then yes. But if you've got one beer going and then you brew the next day and you're brewing a different style of beer with a different yeast and you put that in there, no. He said 10-gallon batch split, same beer, same yeast. He just added There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Then I I think, yeah. Uh, You know, push them together so they're touching. And, uh, you know, you could also wrap, you know, some bubble wrap or something around it. But, yeah, reasonably the same. Yeah. Yeah. But if they're different beers, no. Because sometimes people think, and the reason I jump on that is because people think, well, you know, the, the, the room is at 65, so my fermentation's at 65. Well, it's, no, it's like, that has nothing to do with it. You know, it's the, the heat of fermentation has a big, plays a big role in the actual fermentation temperature. Is there a safe number to assume, like, oh, it's it's going to be four degrees warmer than the ambient temperature, or ten degrees, or does it vary? <laughs> no, it varies radically, depending on the yeast and the 
actual uh, volume. Yeah. There's so many things. All right, you guys want another one? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, from, uh, yeah, why not? We live for this. Yeah. From Spider Wrangler. Uh, he said, Mosaic. Have you guys used it? Have you had beer with it? Yes. Uh, any suggestions on how to make uh, the flavor and aroma characteristics work using other hops to complement or build up certain flavors, etc.? He said, for reference, some of the descriptors he's heard includes grassy, earthy, herbal, citrus, cedar, floral, pine, tropical, spice, stone fruit. You know, it's yeah. ironic they have a hop mosaic virus, and then they name a hop variety right. after that. Right. Um, I got a lot of the stone fruit, tropical, you know, cedar out of that. Um, uh, our good friend uh, Tasty McDowell um, uh, did a uh, mosaic beer and uh, was kind enough to uh, part with some samples. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the thing I got on, on Mosaic was that and also kind of a, um, you know, in that case, it, it seemed rather subtle overall uh, for the amount that he had put in that batch. I was, I thought it was kind of a restrained kind of, you know, all those, those characters are fruit. present, but. Compared to, say, another tropical fruit variety or. Yeah, it was it was it was quite stone fruity, you know, peachy, tropical fruity, passion fruit, a lot of yeah. passion fruit. Okay, uh, in that. So I don't know. Uh, whatever you use that, and I I like the combination. I, I guess is the question: <laughs> what 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 kind of beer would you use that in, or how would you? Um. Yeah. Well, he didn't ask that directly, but that seems like a good question. Uh. All right. Hey, coming up with the questions and answering them. <laughs> uh, could I be any better? Bases. Right. Uh. No. I think. Um. You know what I like is. Uh. You know uh, the caramel characters, kind of like uh. You know a caramel candy character with the tropical fruit. Uh. We do that in Evil Twin. I try and have a, a lot of caramel and a lot of tropical fruit, and I think the two go together really nicely in a beer. So uh, that's one of the things I go for. Uh, and, and I think the, the beer I tried it in was uh, just kind of like a blonde, kind of pale ale-ish beer. But I think a little more... And the weird thing was, in that one, I thought, like, the caramel kind of... No, see, i got to backtrack here, because I thought the caramel kind of countered it. <laughs> but in general, maybe it wasn't enough of both. I think if you're going with a, a subtle character... Go with a pale blonde. Don't use a lot of crystal malt. If you're going to go overboard and totally blast it with those hops, then maybe some caramel to kind of Bounce get that dessertish kind of thing going on. Hmm. Uh, I, don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. So. All right. Good couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Who's next? Who's next? Uh, let's see. Ricky. Hey, guys. Can't in too much headspace in the fermenter, primary and or secondary, uh, affect the yeast flocculation. Uh, he's got a whole backstory here. Let's see. A couple of months ago, I brewed amber that split into two, two and a half gallon batches. He's been going to 60 gallon bucket for fermentation. I pitched a Y yeast 1056, and one Y yeast 1272, and the other in order to compare the yeast strains and attenuation one, one point in each other. I noticed that the 1272 didn't flocculate as much as the 1056, but I didn't think much at the time. Both beers consistently give me really bad gas, and friends have also complained about stomach problems I've drank in this beer. I've been brewing about four years. My problem is pretty consistent. This is the first time I brewed this recipe, and this is my time of using these yeast strains. After going to my notes, I can, cannot figure out anything different in the process. My time is except the extra head space in the fermenters. And this could lead to the oxidation issue, but anyway, it could affect the yeast flocculation. I love your show and read your books, How to Brew Yeast. You know, amazing resource. Thanks for all the great info, Ricky. I had the exact same question yesterday. Yes. I'm glad he asked. All right. Um, uh, what I really appreciate is that he put the question in the very first line, <laughs> and then all that other stuff is just after it. Um, you know, uh, you know, you know all, all sorts of things can affect flocculation. Uh, you know, if flocculation, that, that's one of the first signs that a yeast gives that, you know, something's... Not quite right. Yeah. Um, or, you know, one of the, the mutations that happens quite early on. The thing that in his backstory that I notice is that he's talking about Y yeast 1056, American Ale 1, and Y yeast 1272, American Ale 2. And he's noticing that the 1272 didn't flocculate as much as the 1056. Right. But... 
they're different yeast strains, so they're not going to flocculate exactly the same. Right. Um, you know, um, that's you know one of the differences between different yeasts. Uh, so don't expect all yeast to flocculate the same. The fact that you get really bad gas, and friends have also complained about stomach trembles after drinking this beer. Might want to let the yeast settle out first. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's it. Maybe you guys are just a farty couple of bastards. I don't know. That could be. Could be. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I always, I always let my beer, you know, fall bright before yeah. I try. But drinking. you fart a lot too. Well, yeah. <clears throat> so that's the food I eat. It's just the way I roll. <laughs> There you go. There's your answer. Be Maybe good, it's the food you eat. Be a good name of uh, Stone Stones next beer. Farty couple of bastards. <laughs> farty, farty couple of bastards. Uh, okay. Farty, farty bastard. Yes. You get some real sulfury kind of uh, yeast and the hops in there. Call it farty bastard. There you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> More questions look. from the chat or break? No, or let's, take a, let's take a short break. I need okay. a break. <laughs> we'll be back after this. Hi, I'm Jason Harris, the proud owner here at Keystone Homebrew Supply. We're thrilled to be entering our 20th year of supplying this great industry. And to show you, the Brewing Network Army, how much we appreciate your support, we're offering you 10% off your first order on our website, keystonehomebrew.com. Just use coupon code BNARMY at checkout, and I'll get your order out the same day. My goal at Keystone Homebrew Supply has always been to have a complete supply of everything a brewer could want. When you place your order online or when you come into our store, it's our goal to have everything on your list and more. One aspect of KeystoneHomebrew.com that we're really excited about is the ability to fulfill customers' exact grain bills. Do you hate to wait? Keystone Homebrew Supply can get your precious yeast and hops to you within just one day if you live between Connecticut and Virginia and within two days east of the Mississippi. KeystoneHomebrew.com I'm Jason Harris and I approve this message. A vial of White Labs yeast yeast is the key to your best beer. When you open a vial of White Labs yeast, you're giving your beer its best chance for a perfect fermentation. In addition to their already incredible variety of yeast, White Labs is proud to announce WLP 90, San Diego's super yeast, now available year-round. WLP 90 is super clean, super fast fermenting, with low esters and has a neutral flavor and aroma profile. It's alcohol tolerant and highly flocculent. For more of the latest White Labs news, click over to whitelabs.com, where you can read reviews of yeast, learn in the lab section, and join the customer club. And if you should find yourself in San Diego, White Labs has a brand new training facility for craft brewers and home brewers alike. Whitelabs.com. Discover yeast, nutrients, enzymes, and more for commercial breweries, home brewers, and homebrew stores. White Labs. It's all in the vial. Hi, I'm Jamel Zanishef, and in addition to my work on the Brewing Network, I write the style profile column in every issue of Brew Your Own magazine. Hi, I'm Sean Paxton, and when I'm not prepping for the home brewed chef on the Brewing Network, you can find me writing articles on how to cook with your home brew for Brew Your Own magazine. Greetings, cretins. This is John Palmer, and when I'm not writing for Brew Your Own, I'm reading it. John Palmer, Sean Paxton, Jamil Zanishev. If you love listening to them on the Brewing Network, you'll love reading their articles, tips, and recipes in the pages of Brew Your Own magazine. Join Jamil, John, and Sean eight times a year in Brew Your Own. And when you subscribe to BYO on the Brewing Network website, half of your subscription price goes right back to the BN to support great beer and food programming. So sign up for Brew Your Own magazine through the BN website today so you can listen and read Read your way to better homebrew. For nearly 15 years, homebrewers have been served by one place in Michigan where you can buy yourself a serial killer grain mill. Adventures in homebrewing. Did you try all those great Michigan beers at the National Homebrewers Conference in San Diego or Seattle? Adventures in homebrewing delivered. Did you see a great false bottom in your buddy's cooler or brew kettle? Adventures in homebrewing delivered that. And did you see that great custom built brew stand? Yep, Adventures in homebrewing delivered. Since 1999, Adventures in homebrewing in Taylor, Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and online at homebrewing.org has been serving homebrewing 
home brewers across the globe. Check out their innovative 2.5 gallon keg with metal handles, great homebrew kits, and the fully adjustable serial killer grain mill. Visit them in Philly for the 2013 National Homebrewers Conference. Not going to make it? Check out all the fun of adventures in homebrewing at homebrewing.org. For a limited time, coupon code BNETWORK will slam 10% off your order. Bam! Adventures in homebrewing. Join the adventure at the Great Lakes Home for Homebrewing Supplies online at homebrewing.org. And don't forget coupon code BNETWORK for a limited time. Join the adventure today. Are you a hophead? Beer lovers of all stripes will love Brewers Publications' latest release, IPA, Brewing Techniques, Recipes, and the Evolution of India Pale Ale by Mitch Steele. I wanted to write a book that presented an accurate review of the history of IPA and also provided current technical brewing tips and recipe information. India Pale Ale is a style I love because it has a rich, fascinating history, and today it provides brewers a showcase for all the great new hop varieties that are available. I'm so proud of this book, and I know you'll enjoy all the recipes and thoughts from so many of the world's great IPA brewers. IPA is available now from Brewers Publications at brewerspublications.com and your favorite homebrew store. Order your copy today and take your hop forward beers to the next level. American Homebrewers Association and Brewers Association members receive early notice and special discounts to most Brewers Publication releases. Visit brewerspublications.com to learn more and to find a schedule of author appearances. IPA by Mitch Steele. Get yours today. Back to your hosts, Jamil Zanashef and John Palmer. Putting the testicles in technical. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. We're enjoying uh, a, a fine, balmy evening in lovely downtown Martinez. Martinez. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're listening to the lovely sounds of the train. <laughs> the train going yeah. by. Well, the hobos need, you know, train access. You know, it's Pennsylvania well, 65,000. Right. It's, it's one of those, you know, back in the uh, de- Depression era, which uh, Martinez is still experiencing. Mm-hmm. A lot of hobos traveling the rails. Yeah. All those fine. Chattanooga Choo Choo. Big rock candy mountain stuff. Yeah. 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 And here we are. Uh, Answering questions live right. and emailed. Man. You can email your questions to Bruce Strong at the dot com. Title them with Q and A if you want them answered on the Q and A shows. Right. If you I want them answer. not answered, just title them something else. All right. Uh, who who had the last one? Uh, you did. I think right. we did it from the chat, right? No, no. I don't know. Well, I, I've got one here that's that's uh, for me. So. <laughs> So you might as well go ahead and ask. <laughs> you might as well go ahead and do it. Okay, question on podcast 2711, Hop Utilization and Water, from Jack. John, you were wrong. That's what <laughs> no, must have been why I printed that one out. John, you ignorant slut. Anyway, dear sirs, I listened to your podcast on the topic of hop utilization and water. There is a state- statement from John, I think, that recent scientific studies measured the amount of alpha acids going into solution, and it does not depend on more gravity. Can you please provide me with a reference, or better yet, a link, which documents those recent scientific studies? <clears throat> well, it's a good question. Um, and yeah, did you say that? I did. Oh, really? Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't believe that. I'd be the same. I'd be like, what the fuck, John? Okay. Um, Where you come up with that shit? The, the context here is a bit misleading, but I can, I can paraphrase. He can come um, up with, in, in paraphrase, he means come up with a bullshit answer to right. kind of smooth that over all right go ahead Th- this uh that statement was from um a couple of papers that tom Schulhammer uh, put out mm. and these were in the it's a good ASBC, source bc i think and not, or it might have been nba but i think it was asbc mm-hmm. and american society of brewing chemists um and what he was doing they were doing isomerization studies mm-hmm. on alpha acids mm-hmm. as a function of temperature mm-hmm. They did examine uh, different work gravities and mm-hmm. found that there is no difference in the amount of isomerization that occurred at you know gravity A versus gravity B. And I don't remember what those gravities mm-hmm. were at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, it's, it's just really, you know, isomerization is one thing, but right. it's also the 
dissolution of the material in the solution that is maybe affected. So isomerization, sol- yeah, solubility. Is, solubility is different than the isomerization, which is a rate, really. right? Right. Yeah. So, so that's not affected, but the solubility is, and that in turn affects the overall IBUs. Right. And solubility is affected by it yeah. for gravity. So while I can't really John provide was you right. A, oh, you bastard. <laughs> I can't really provide sense. a link, but the, the, it was, they were written by uh, Tom Shellhammer. Mm-hmm. And um, the other thing I want to mention was that while the rate... You're the, right. He was wrong. <laughs> no. The isomerization rate is constant. Uh, and it, but Jack, it is you're dependent, wrong. Dependent on temperature. No. The other, the reason that we say in um, in our IBU equation mm-hmm. that uh, the IBUs change as a, or the utilization rate mm-hmm. and the IBUs change as a function of gravity mm-hmm. is because that at higher work gravities um, there is less solubility mm-hmm. of the solubility has changed. Yeah, so there's less to isomerize. Right, but also that at higher work gravities, you have higher amount of break material, mm-hmm. and these alpha acids, which are largely insoluble, mm-hmm. have more surface area to stick onto mm-hmm. in a higher gravity, mm-hmm. and, more, and mm-hmm. therefore higher protein break. Mm-hmm. So more of this, more right. of the alpha acids are carried out of solution, mm-hmm. and that's why you get decreased utilization. At higher gravity. It's like pitching rate and cell size and all that affects how much True. bittering you end up with in the final beer as well. Right. I mean, every, I mean, it almost doesn't matter what you're putting into your beer, you know. And when you're finely tuning your uh, IBU additions into a wort because – and not paying attention to what your pitching rate and your, your, right. your fermentation cells conditions. and, you know, all that in the nutrition, all that – because if that doesn't matter, that that radically changes how much bittering you end up with. So, you know, you might as well just wing the whole thing if you're not going to, you know, pay attention all the way down through the line. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. John, you, you pulled that one out. I'm, Thank, you. Thank you. I am impressed. Yes, that makes perfect sense to me. I think that is very, very good. That was a, a, a very educational answer and i learned something on that all right uh let's see donald asks about uh sour uh equipment cleaning as we decide to make more and more sour beers we've been wondering what can be cleaned and what equipment should be reused for sour and non-sour beers i'm even wondering about if we can reuse pbw and star sand for both type beers make five gallon buckets of each and reuse it until it is dirty so should we make different ones to clean and sanitize our sour equipment? Of course, our tubing is separate, and we're using our old better bottles for sour beers, but can plastic funnels be cleaned and used for both when pitching yeast? How about O2 stones? Can PBW even destroy cysts formed by some bacteria? Mm-hmm. You know, if you're using something until it's dirty, yeah. I mean, once it's dirty, it's too late. Right. You want to change it out before it's dirty. I mean, you know, the meaning of the word dirty. So maybe it's like, well, you know, they don't want to use it because it's about to become truly dirty. Yeah. Um, would you make separate PBW and star sand? They're different things. Um, I would not worry about reusing the same PBW in both, although I guess you would have some carryover bacteria, but the purpose of PBW is to clean uh, material cleaning, off yeah. of it. It's a cleaning thing. Yeah. Uh, and if you're rinsing thoroughly and it's it's effectively cleaning still, then that's fine. Uh, but it's not a sanitizer. Uh, but star sand, um, again, you know, it should be killing off what what right. what's going um i you know for me i wouldn't i wouldn't uh i think it makes perfect sense that you could use it mm-hmm. again for both but i wouldn't just because again like the guy who was worried about the scratches in the bottom of the corny keg right uh you know this one would this one would phase me uh unlike that one yeah. um you could reuse the plastic funnel again it depends on you know scratches and things like that What's the cost of a plastic funnel? It's uh, you know a dollar, yeah. and, and, and the the uh, gross grossly uh, the quarter percenter over there says it's only a dollar. Yeah, 
Well, so the other thing be I true. Think, uh, the other aspect of this question that occurred to me it was that uh, star sand. I mean, making up a five gallon bucket of it and then reusing it between multiple batches. Right. You don't need to soak with star sand. Right. You all you need to Just put in coat. is like yeah, uh, put in a cup worth and shake it all up, get it to coat all right. the surfaces, mm-hmm. and dump that out. Mm-hmm. And then you still got you know the rest of the bucket. I mean, right. it's so Just I make I, up as much as you need. Right. I I mean you and I both said we we typically put star sand in a spray bottle with distilled water as the solvent and just spray things with it. Yeah, um, but I also tend to soak things in star sand too. Well, I make yeah. up the five gallon bucket. I you know okay, and then I spray it. Okay. Spray my hands, spray my face, my body. <laughs> I glove up. You know, I put just on the mask. I just spray, and I I, have, I I don't have any infection problems with it, but. But, so you say. Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, can PBW destroy cysts formed by some bacteria? I don't know mm-hmm. if it's if it can denature the proteins that uh, form the cyst uh, walls or something, right? I suppose it could, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't count on it, but... Uh, mm-hmm. I would Would be a good, friend, good question for our friend John Herskovitz. There Except you go. Wanna... There you go. All right. Moscow, do we got anything from the chat? Uh, Yeah, there's a couple more. Uh, One of them is kind of a funny question. It is, if I... Sorry, no, I'll read a question about sours first. Um, Can pressure impact... I'm going to get to that one. Can pressure impact the sourness of a lacto-inoculation? So he inoculated Mm -hmm. wort... This is from uh, uh, Greg Loves Beer. Uh, He inoculated wort in a keg and uh, did not vent the pressure for a week... The sourness was uh, very low. Was that because of the pressure? I don't think so. Probably just because of the time. Yeah, that, you know, temperature, time, temperature, inoculation rate, you know, substrate, things like that. But uh, uh, pressure affects all organisms. You know, the function of of cells and anything, uh, you know, the amount of pressure changes, uh, you know, especially with the buildup of... Um, uh, the excrement, essentially, of you know the, the the process from bacteria or from yeast. It's like yeast put out all the CO two, and when you trap that and you keep them under pressure with all the CO two waste, mm-hmm. um, it tends to suppress their activity. Yeah, I imagine the same thing could be true on bacteria. I don't know for a fact, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, most you, you put a person in a room and trap you know their output of co2 the person starts to slow down <laughs> yeah, yeah you know it's a, a i think that there's there might be something there to that he's adding to it now he says seven days uh between 80 and 90 degrees the starter was uh from a yeah. white labs vial right um know, but a week still seems like a short period of time for bacterial uh, inoculation you know you can get pretty sour you know the the if it was a higher temperature i'd say yeah you know, and it, it, it. What's your perception of sour? If it started out at higher gravity, and you know there's still some residual there, I, I don't really know. Uh, pH is a good measurement of sourness, and uh, you know I would I would monitor that. But I I would tend to bleed off the pressure if it were me. Yeah. Just because I think that pressure isn't good for just about any organism. Well, there's one more you want to take a break and do it when we come back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let's do this. Uh, Let's take a break. And when we come back, a little bit more of this. Hey, brewers, it's planting season. Have you ever dreamt of walking through your own hop garden? Well, look no further than Woodburn, Oregon, and the Crosby Family Hop Farm. Blake Crosby and his family have been passionately growing hops for five generations. And right now, they're taking orders for 2013 Rhizomes for all retail and wholesale customers. The Crosbys know how to grow hops and are here to help you establish your family's very own successful hop garden. In fact, when you plant a hop rhizome from the Crosbys, you're using the same plant your favorite professional brewer bought his hops from. Friendly professional service, fast shipment, and quality hops at competitive prices. The Crosby family brings all of this to you. Call 503-982-5166. 
866 or visit bcrosbyhops.com and let Blake Crosby and the Crosby Hop Farm help make your hop garden a reality. bcrosbyhops.com. Hops from the Crosby family farm to yours. BN Army, Hop Tech has a great discount waiting for you. Do you often find it difficult to find specific specialty ingredients for your home brew recipes? Well, listen to this. Hop Tech stocks 59 different grains to choose from, 39 varieties of pellet hops, and 8 kinds of holy pops. And Hop Tech not only carries Y yeast and White Labs yeast for you, but also Fermentus 04, 5, 6, 23, 33, and T58 Belgian yeast, plus Cooper's Nottingham and Windsor yeasts. Got your recipe ready to go? Pick up some great brew gear like new long and short sleeve shirts, games, and more. HopTech's new website is being updated every day with new items. If you don't see it, call the shop. They're open six days a week. BN Army and AHA members get a 10% discount, and active military personnel get 15% off. Visit HopTech.com today for great selection, great service, and a great discount. HopTech.com. That's it. I putting hops in my beer again. What? Why? It's just too ridiculous. Insane prices, stupid contract, high shipping costs, crappy selection. Dude, you need Nico Brew. Nico Brew will rock your f***ing face right the f*** off your f***ing skull. Five dollars shipping to all 50 states, plus fantastic international rates get you low prices on Nico Brew's great selection of hops and more. Whether you're a home brewer, a pro brewer, or a home brew shop owner, Owner, Nico Brew can get you the hops you need in increments big and small, single orders, spot buys, or full contracts. And there's only one place to join the uber special secret elite bare bones club where you'll get the best deals anywhere. Holy f-ing shit! NicoBrew.com. N I K O B R E W. Nico Brew, your bare bones buddy in the brewing business. Tonight is the night. We bring the creature to life, Dr. Blitzenstein? Yes, J.P. Gore. Everything is perfect for my next fermented creation. My daughter, the storm is too far away. We'll never have enough power to isomerize the creature's alpha acid. <laughs> yes, J.P. Gore, we will. For I have in my possession the Tower of Power. Glickman's new Tower of Power is the evolution of automation. Control hot liquor, sparge, and mash temps like a pro. The Tower of Power is a high-quality gas-fired rim system that works with your current brewing setup. With ultra-precision, the tower can hold your mash to one-half of a degree Fahrenheit. Precision and repeatability. The Tower of Power is the answer to automatic, fast ramp times. See more at BlickmanEngineering.com. Bring your next creation to life with the Tower of Power. Dr. Glickman, with the Tower of Power, you can probably give me an afternoon at the pub to enjoy. Don't be silly, J.P. Gore. We have beer to brew. When I order a beer, I want my server to know more about it than I do. I want someone who enjoys good beer and loves helping others enjoy it, too. I want someone who knows how to pour a perfect pint for any beer style. I want a Cicerone. The Cicerone certification program is creating the type of people who help you enjoy great beer. Home brewers and craft beer lovers know beer is more flavorful and complex than ever, and it takes some serious knowledge to store and serve beer right. Cicerones, no beer. There are three levels in the Cicerone program. Certified Beer Server, Certified Cicerone, and Master Cicerone. Cicerones are truly the sommeliers of beer. The best beer locations have a certified Cicerone on staff. Relaxed and unpretentious, Cicerones are tested on storing and serving beer, beer styles, flavor and tasting, the brewing process, Process and ingredients and pairing food with beer. Learn more about your next beer guide at Cicerone.org. Certified Cicerone, because it takes top talent to present a perfect pint. All right, BN Army, it's trivia time. What's the only homebrew shop with over 1,000 recipe kits, $4.99 shipping on orders over 100 bucks, and is also home of the Wolf Shirt? The one and only answer is Austin Homebrew Supply. For over 20 years, they've specialized in creating recipes such as the best-selling Texas Blonde Ale. Apocalypso, Hot Bomb 2.0, and Double Chocolate Stout. And they just recently unveiled their small grain kits that produce one gallon of beer. Visit AustinHomebrew.com to browse their extensive catalog of equipment and ingredients. They also have many clone recipes of your favorite commercial beers. They're the exclusive retailer of Brew Vent Yeast Fuel as well, Yeast Nutrient, and
on the all-new Bodybuilder. Follow Austin Homebrew Supply on Google Plus to participate in video hangouts on popular brewing topics. So visit AustinHomebrew.com today and make sure you sign up for their weekly email with news and specials. Austin Homebrew Supply, AustinHomebrew.com. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like wine guys. Brew strong. All right, we're back. We're enjoying each other's company here. And if you want to enjoy the company of your fine friends, I suggest going to adamandeve.com. Pick up something sensual for you and your friends. Uh, oh no! Seriously, you can go to uh, our fine sponsor, Adam and Eve. Uh-huh. Get you use the offer code Jamel J A M I L. Uh, you're going to get fifty percent off uh, just about any one item. You pick an item, fifty percent off. Okay. You know, get the giant whatever you want, or the get the party pack of condoms, or party pack, or the uh, the grande size, whatever. Fifty uh, percent off or DVD. And once you once you've got that item in your cart, you're going to get uh, a free extra gift. You're going to get free shipping, and you get three free DVDs of your choice. That's pretty good. That they're your, of your choice, right? It's not just like the the uh, the pig fucker thing. It's you get to choose from genres such as anal, amateur, Asian, big breasts, big butts, bisexual, chunky coeds, fetish, gay, interactive POV, lesbian, milfs, etc. Yeah, your choice. Okay, I'll. Uh... Again, the free shipping, all that stuff. You can even do this from your mobile phone. You go to adamandeve.com. You can shop from your phone. Look at this. The uh, quarter percenter over there, he's already ordering up a big uh, six-pack of dildos. Uh, So you go to adamandeve.com. Offer code Jamel. 50% off one item. Three free adult DVDs. uh, A free uh, sensual gift. And free shipping. All that stuff. One item. 50% off. It's quite a deal. I think so. And uh, a lot of satisfied customers. So go check them out. Uh, if, if if you got something that uh, a friend to experience uh, good things with, uh, yeah, I like Eve could make it a little bit more fun. Go check it out. That's what Palmer and I use all the time, Adam and Eve. Right. You know, going off to uh, JBF together or right. NHC See together. We always... So we started off with a visit to adamandeve.com. But my wife drew the line at using my name for the offer code. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they didn't want, didn't want too many Johns on the Adam and Eve side. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. We got just uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. What have we got in the chat? Let's make sure we, we cover those since people are listening live. Well, this one might be a little silly. It's from Riggs. He says, if you mix two parts hoppy IPA and one part barley wine, will you have a drinkable Imperial IPA? Well, it depends on the the individual beers. Um, drinkable? Yeah, sure. If the if all those beers were good, sure. Um, you know, will it be the best Imperial IPA possible? Probably not. But, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is um, if you judge a lot of competitions and mm-hmm. you judge some strong beers or something, and, you know, there's the dump bucket, right? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever drank the dump bucket? I have. I have. Have you yes. really? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I had a few too many. You lose a I bet? Drink, drink, no. I just, just people like, well, you know, it would be horrible. And it's, you know, if it if you're drinking, if you're judging with people that you would kiss anyways, uh, you know, it's it's not that bad. Um, and surprisingly, often it's, it's a beer with a great balance. It's got a lot of malt character, a lot of hop character. <laughs> it's really not that bad. It's shockingly good. <laughs> yeah. You're thinking this is going to be like, you know, sewage. Yeah. It's not. So sometimes, you know, blending different beers can be a good thing and, and it just depends on the beers. So I'm not saying it wouldn't be, but. Um, you know, it really depends on the beers. You could make something really nice, though. So. Yeah, I don't think there's anything magical in like an imperial barley wine, though, because the well, alcohol the imperial percents... IPA, taking a regular really hoppy IPA, and mm-hmm. you know, raising the gravity that way. That you know, the barley wines tend to be too malty for a good 
uh, Imperial, I think. But but that's that a blend a, you can see working. I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, a, Why not? A, a hoppy barley wine versus... Something I've done before is, like, you take a sour beer, mm-hmm. and you take, a, like, a real hoppy double IPA, mm-hmm. and you mix those two, you know, not mix them, but, you know, you have a, a pint get of a, each. Get a blend. You get going. a blend. You know, a little bit of this, a little mm-hmm. bit of that. And that's really nice. Or sometimes, you know, a a beer that's exceedingly sour and a beer that's uh, a bit too sweet, you blend a little bit of both of those in in whatever proportion, and you get this nice, uh, uh, you know, balance of of sour or sweet, and and it can be quite nice, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the way that, you know, certain beers are made. You know, certain Belgian beers are made that way where they they blend, you know, the old and the new, the soured, the non-soured. Um, there's some British beers like that, and it, it, you know you can actually, it's those characters that you can't get separate. You know, in in brewing one beer, you can't, you can actually create something that you can't do all on its own in one fermentation. You have to, you know, fully attenuate this thing with souring. You have to, you know, build, you know, all this malt character, or something else, and then blend them together to truly get that. So, uh, you know. Um, so it wasn't a silly question. Right. There you yeah. go. There's sort of an answer. All right. We got one more? Uh, that's it from the chat tonight. All right. Well, let's see here. Uh, we got time for one more. One more. One more. All right. Do you have a good one, John, or you want me to? Uh, throw it's an easy one. Oh, that's perfect. Let's okay. go with that one. Uh, Q&A, whole hop adjustments. Mm. Jamil and John, what type of adjustments should I make when using whole hops? Is there a standard wort absorption rate that I should be using? What about the rate of IBUs? Thanks for putting on a great show. From Josh. First, I don't think you should be using whole hops. Well, that's just me. I don't know. And, <laughs> and some hop scientists. Um, um You'll get more less attenu- less isomerization, less utilization. utilization. Yeah, uh, isomerization based on temperature, mm-hmm. uh, less utilization um, uh, with the whole cone. But right. I guess one of the questions that, that I thought was interesting on this one was he's asking maybe about wort wort ab- absorption. Yeah. And you know, does he need to calculate for you know the loss of uh, wort? At the end of the boil, you know, you got this big mass of fluffy hop cones at the bottom. Yeah, um, I don't know what that number is because like, I again, I, I don't tend to use uh, whole cones anymore. Yeah, I, I I often do, and certainly whole hops absorb more liquid than the pellets, mm-hmm. um, or re- they're not necessarily they're absorbing it, but retaining it, it yeah. in structure. Yeah, and there's more nooks and crannies, yeah. nooks and crannies in there that uh, are tying it up. But uh, I, yeah, I don't. Have, you have a number on that? I don't. I don't have a number. Uh, you're useless to this guy, John. I am. But I get that all the time. You're so supposed to just bother. guess and just claim it's it's precise. Say, like, well, I've measured it. It's <laughs> oh, uh, point six. It's apparently eight percent. Yeah. Eight okay. percent. Sounds good. Um, the I guess the turn to, to turn the question around a little bit. Uh, it. We commonly talk about ten percent more utilization, utilization from right. pellets. Right. So that's just a number that's been thrown around for for years. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody Who knows? Kind of takes it for granted. Right. You know, the rule of thumb kind of thing. Be interesting to measure that. I think if we go back to statements we made earlier tonight, um, where you know, brew consistently. I thought you were talking when you told me you love me. Uh, just, no, no. All right. uh, I, I, I totally me- messed up. All right. Uh-huh. Um, but brew consistently and adjust from there. Mm-hmm. So, right. You know, it, uh, don't look, don't look, don't look to us for a standard <laughs> for word an answer. Rate. Yeah. I guess we don't have one. <laughs> so, so keep track of your results. Yes. And, again, and again, like you're saying, I guess, uh, you know, the the difference between pellets and whole hops may be eaten up by a different pitching rate. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to fermentation. Right. Or, you know, definitely by yeast strain. Mm-hmm. If you go to White Labs and, you know, try, they've got a whole a bar there now where uh, they'll take the same wort and they'll pitch like 10 different yeasts in it. 
and you order by you know yeast strains, yeah, and, and you can you can try all these. You will swear that they're completely different worts. You'll be like, well, there's no way this was the same IBU wort uh, as this one. It, it seems like it's half the bittering. Right, right. You know, uh, it seems like it's twice the bittering. It seems like it's you know got a bunch of crystal malt in it. it seems like it's got none. It seems like it's got uh, you know a huge amount of late hops. It seems like it has no late hops. All this is done by yeast. Yeah, uh, it's a radical difference. So if you're not paying attention to that, then you know maybe this difference between whole hops and pellet hops uh, is imagined in some people. I, I think there is some difference in utilization, just yeah. the exposure of. The no, materials. I don't think it's a, a, it's enough difference to be able to calculate it. Yeah, yeah. Without tying every other factor down first. So there you go. There's okay. your answer. All right, another fine show. I think. Uh, you know, we were very professional, and uh, <laughs> we drank uh, far more than we should and enjoyed ourselves. Uh, far less than we often do. <laughs> no, I enjoyed myself a lot. <laughs> okay. I always enjoy myself doing the show, man. That's true. Right. I had a great time. So if you enjoyed this show, go check out our sponsors, uh, especially BlickmanEngineering.com. Blickman with two N's. Uh, fine uh, gear to innovate your homebrew. And check out the Brewing Network store. There's uh, books, there's uh, DVDs, there's shirts, hats, glassware, all sorts of great stuff that you can pick up there. And when you do, it helps support the shows of the Brewing Network. And uh, you can continue to get this stuff for free. So uh, don't don't hesitate to do that. And check out uh, great things like uh, Brew Your Own Magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we all tend to write for that uh, here now and then. And uh, if you uh, sign up for a... Uh, Subscription. subscription through the Brewing Network. Go to brewingnetwork.com and, and sign up for the Brewing Net, uh, Brew Your Own Magazine. Half that subscription price goes back to the Brewing Network to support the show. And you get a great magazine. So check it out. Till then, Brew Strong. Brew Strong, everybody. Brew Strong.